Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on data resilience and recovery with object storage. My name is Adrian Herrera. I will be the moderator for today. The expert with me is John Bell, Senior Technical Customer Engineer at DataCore. Hey, John, why don't you introduce yourself to everyone? I, I think they, they've heard me if they've been following this series, uh, but you are new to the series, although you are an expert in the space. So I think giving a, a little bit of your background is, is uh, appropriate here. Sure, thanks, AJ. Uh, I've, I've been uh, working on the Swamp product for the better part of 10 years, uh, and basically in, in object storage for that period of time. I've had the opportunity to watch it evolve over that period of time from your, your basic core, you know, the fundamental piece of, of being a, an object store to uh, evolving into other areas such as uh, data analytics with list and query and uh, protocol personality supporting uh, APIs such as S3 and so on. And it had really had a great chance to, to help build this over time. Uh, and, and looking forward to presenting to you today. And John has been involved in a lot of different deployments. He's seen a lot of different scenarios. He's a wealth of knowledge, which is why it's great to have him walk us through this content, resilience and recovery with object storage. And specifically in this webinar, what you're gonna learn is you know, object storage, the resilience and recovery features and approaches in, in general object storage, also um, some that are unique to Swarm, and why you need to think differently at petabyte scale. I think there's this, this conversation about you know, backing up your primary data sets and backing up your, your secondary uh, and tertiary data sets that uh, is, is really becoming very relevant in today's space just because of the scale of data sets, and, and we'll, we'll discuss that. Uh, we're going to talk about how these approaches differ from RAID on traditional NAS. Uh, we'll go over the, the difference in overhead and, and the difference in, in really the value that you get from choosing object storage uh, over uh, RAID and NAS. Uh, we'll talk about how object storage fits into the 3 2 one, one backup rule. And then we'll, we'll talk about how object storage is a part of a complete ransomware and malware protection strategy. And of course, at any time, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and ask them. Uh, just go ahead and type them up. We'll try to get to them as we present. If for some reason we don't get to them, we'll go ahead and follow up via email. Uh, or you can always uh, email us directly at info at data core. We'll put the, this, uh, this email address at, at the, uh, the, the end of the webinar. Uh, but we'd like to have a, an informal discussion, so please do feel free to ask questions. Uh, we'd like to answer them as we present. Anything to add to this, John, uh, b before we start? No, let's go ahead and dive into it, AJ. All right. So I think let's we're, we're setting the foundation. We're setting the framework or, or the, the, the building blocks of, of protection on object storage. So why don't you walk everyone through their options? Certainly. So, so there are a couple of ways to approach protecting your data uh, within an object storage solution. And, and the two primary ones that you see are, of course, making copies of the data within the object store via replication. Uh, or you can hash it out into uh, data and parity sets using erasure coding. And depending on the use case that you have and the type of data that you're going to be instantiating into the cluster, you may choose one uh, approach over the other. Uh, that said, you're not necessarily locked into choosing one or the other. Um, our solution is designed to accommodate both protection uh, approaches uh, when storing your data within the system. You can have a combination of replicated or erasure coded uh, objects residing uh, in the storage. And, and of course, how these how these things scale with mines of availability and, and their overhead is, is going to be based on which one you choose. One, ones will have more efficiency than the other. Ones may be designed more for optimized access. And we'll go into that in more detail as, as we move through the presentation. But, but, but it's not only for nines of availability here, also think in terms of nines of durability for your data as well. That's what we're trying to address here. Yeah, I think it's important to note, I mean, the connection between object storage and cloud storage and, and that, that cloud storage is really enabled by object storage. And a lot of the different SLAs and, and difference in pricing that you see from the cloud storage, the service providers actually deploy or, or, or I should say employ different variations of replication or ratio coding, correct, John, and, and, and different types of media on the back end. Uh, but, but it's usually oh, object storage. Yeah. 
Yeah, mo most mo most certainly. And, and the key to that is 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 bringing into your organization the same scale up, scale out approach for for handling your storage within your organization. And that that is uh, the key feature that object storage attempts to address. Uh, yeah, and I, I'm calling it out also just from a cost perspective at petabyte, at petabyte scale. You know that that you know with with these two, you're really able to optimize for costs and for uh, performance. And why don't you walk over, you know, everyone through this? Certainly. So, so, so there's a there's a matrix here where you want to make some decisions as to what type of protection scheme you want to use for the data that you're going to be placing into the object store. And, and we have a fairly simplified diagram here that that describes that decision making process. Um, for example, at, at the upper left hand part portion of, of the diagram, we have small clusters that are going to be holding uh, small objects. And typically that's going to fall into a scheme of just using, you know, very simple replication scheme to protect the data within the cluster. Uh, as, as you get into petabyte or even exabyte scale and you start storing a, a mix and match uh, of uh, large objects, uh, especially for larger objects, where you're storing a, a very large number of large objects, for efficiency's sake, while providing the same availability and durability, uh, you want to move into using an erasure coding protection scheme for, for that data. So, so basically, you're just walking from one side of the diagram to the other, depending on the use case that you have and the nature of the data that you're going to be placing in, into the storage. And this is just a guideline, right? I mean, would, would you ever use replication for large objects? You most certainly can. You, you may have situations where um, you, you, want, you don't want to, uh, for example, uh, let's say you have a, a data that's read very frequently. In, in some, sometimes in those cases, it's better off to use replication for that kind of data because that uh, keeps you from avoiding having to do things like uh, present up a logical object by pulling together the, the, the different uh, segments to present a logical stream to the client. If it's accessed frequently, you may, you may see in certain cases, and, and this is the whole magic, AJ, behind elastic content protection within our solution, is you can have the same type of protection schemes at the same time running in the cluster. And you can even uh, move the data between different protection schemes depending on how it's being used at, at any given time. And, and, and this, this is the type of flexibility at petabyte scale that we try to provide in this solution. Yeah, absolutely. I guess that, that's it to, to, to say, say what you just said another way. You can set policies that move between replication or erasure coding throughout the life of, of the data, in, in addition to storing replicate and erasure coding on the same infrastructure. Yeah, that, that's the key. And, and, and the other piece to that is that the, the system will track that, those policies and how you want to move them back and forth automatically and take care of that for you. Yeah, so, so the point for, for everyone out there listening is you don't need to just you know, select one and then that's it. You, you can shift between replication or erasure coding at least in Swarm you can, you can shift from one to the other and optimize depending on the value of the data at that time. Right. So, and, and we, we, you know, there, there's the value of the data and kind of referenced the, you know, optimizing for costs. You know, let, let's talk about overhead versus RAID. So you have replication, you have erasure coding, you know, in traditional NAS, you can create copies, right? In traditional NAS, you can also use RAID and RAID is very similar to erasure coding. Erasure coding is just more of a file-based or object-based kind of RAID or using parity segments. But why don't you walk everyone through the overhead, what, what that actually means when you apply it to your volumes? Sure. I mean, what we have here is what, is what amounts to a, a reasonably simplified uh, representation of the differences between uh, the various approaches. In, in the file system side of the world with traditional RAID, such as RAID 5, uh, you have your overhead for, you know, the file system itself, the, the RAID overhead and, and whatnot. And after the, the file system has been formatted, of course, uh, you have things like 10% min-free and so on that are associated with that. And ultimately, you, you have a pool of usable so storage that's at a given amount. Uh, moving to the right, we have the replication approach using two replicas on, on JBOD. There's no RAID overhead involved at all. And in fact, in, in, in our solution, there's no uh, file system overhead 
involved at all either. It's the, the volumes that are used purely for, for, for storing the data. Um, there's a little bit of overhead for, for some journaling that needs to take place, but otherwise, uh, you know, what you see is what you get with, with replication. You're going to have, with two replicas, you're going to have 50% over, overhead is what it amounts to. Uh, or I'm sorry, 100% overhead. Um, but in the case of erasure coding, you can start tuning down that overhead uh, dramatically. So, so what you have here on, on the far right is you have a 10-2 a erasure coding scheme where you have 10 data segments and two parity segments laid out on just a bunch of disks. And, and as you can see there, the, the overhead for that is, is much lower. And the overhead constitutes basically the, the, the parity and then of course the, the, the perhaps a very small portion of, of journaling that takes place for the volume. And as a result, your usable storage for, um, for laying out data in that fashion within the object store becomes you know, much larger. And you have you have much better efficiency to work with there as a result. All you know what we're assuming here, of course, is that we're working with the the exact same pool of hardware, and we're just adjusting the efficiencies based on the on the various approaches that could be used with that hardware. Yeah, absolutely. But when you apply scale, when you start to extrapolate out into the future, you know, three years, five years down the road, you can really see the benefits of that savings. You know, it it, it starts to compound over time. Not, not only savings, but uh, you know there are, there are implications here uh, from a technical side with things like bit rot. I mean, who wants to run RAID five forever? In fact, RAID five uh, is one of those technologies that you know as you scale up, like you say, AJ, it just becomes uh, unviable as a solution. You can't you can't do it that way at multiple petabyte or even exabyte scale. You can't trust your data to be well protected. You, you have so many failures happening potentially within that pool of equipment that you, you can't really trust it to you know, keep your data available and durable. Whereas in, in, in an object store, you don't have those issues. You know, it's, it's self-healing um, and, and, it, and it heals quickly. And we'll, we'll talk about that later as we go through the presentation. Yeah, I think that's a good segue to the next uh, section here, replication, doing a deep dive on repl replication, just showing uh, the viewers how replication actually behaves and actually works. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, start with this. You can walk us through this example. Yeah, most certainly. So, so this, is a, this is a simple scenario where we, each of, of the objects that's stored in, in the cluster has two replicas associated with it. You have three server chassis. Um, and as a result, um, you, and also you have nine objects stored in the system. So as a result, you basically have what we call 18 streams that are stored in the cluster and they're spread across, uh, the, these three chassis. And I, I believe then we go through failure. Yep. So, so in the case of having one of these, uh, chassis completely fail, um, before the recovery, you basically have six objects or six streams, uh, per, per chassis. And uh, after recovery, you, you need to have nine of those per chassis. And what's going to happen is that uh, the, the, uh, the system is going to pick up the fact that this chassis is no longer available. The copies that were associated with that chassis need to be trued back up in the remainder of the cluster. And it's going to go through the process of creating the necessary reps so that the, they're trued back up to their protection scheme, to their protection policy. Uh, the neat, neat thing about this is that all of this process is transparent to any client requests that are coming in. The data is fully available and accessible as, as this recovery process takes place. So theoretically, John, I mean, you've seen a lot of deployments out there. I mean, how often does this happen on an average size cluster and how often does this happen on a large cluster? And maybe if you can just let, let the viewers know what an average size cluster is, what a large size cluster, and, and kind of how, how often this process occurs. Sure. Uh, you know, just speaking from field experience, what, what we would consider to be an average size cluster could, could range in the range of, say, hundreds. We would, we would use the magnitude of hundreds of terabytes, for example. That would be a, a typical cluster. A, a large cluster, of course, is, is going to be into petabytes or, or multiple petabytes. Uh, you know, one, two, three figures of petabyte scale easily. And uh, what, what we see in, in those situations is that um, in, in the case of the quote unquote normal sized uh, clusters, you don't, you typically don't have a, a large number of simultaneous volume failures uh, happening. But as, as clusters get larger, 
you know, the chances for a, an individual drive to fail goes up in, within the cluster. And, and even, the, you know, in very large clusters, the chances for an individual chassis to go down can go up as well. That's, that's just the way the availability calculations work. And um, so it's very important that, you know, you have the ability to recover from those situations quickly as you approach very large scale. And, and that's what our system is designed to do. As, as, you, as you get into these situations where you have petabytes, you know, across say, you know, tens or even hundreds of chassis with hundreds or, or even thousands of volumes, for example, uh, having two or three volumes go down at the same time is something that's quite feasible to happen. And you want to design your protection schemes around the fact that that can happen. And, and if you do that properly, then, then it's not going to be an issue uh, as, as far as, you know, relying on commodity equipment, let's say. Ho hopefully that covers it, AJ. Yeah, that covers it. I, I just wanted to, to get the concept of scale and the scales we're talking about out so the viewers know exactly what we're talking about. We're not talking about tens of terabytes. We're usually talking hundreds of terabytes to multiple petabytes. Yeah, most certainly, and, and and the solution is designed to scale up and down. You know, you can you can have dead instances that are very fall very small, but we're concerned about extremely large scale and being able to tackle the the challenges that uh, we're presented with there. Yeah, and that kind of drives home this point, right? That you know, when you're only dealing with a, a small a small amount of hardware, a small amount of infrastructure, you know, sometimes you can't put the right protection method into place. I mean, you could virtualize these and have these on the same on one box, but it's just driving home that point. Correct. Right. You're, you're basically seeing a scenario here where you have a very small deployment. Um, perhaps it's a it's a, uh, a promotion chain of some kind. You have a development, and then you have test, and then you know you move up into higher scale with UAT, and then you promote to prod for for people that like to do things that way. Um, but but the key here is that what happens in this type of situation where you just have two chassis and you're using the same criteria where reps is equal to two for the objects that are stored in the cluster. So let, let's kick off the failure mode here and, and talk through it. So, so one of the chassis goes down. The, the simple thing to, to take to bear in mind here is that there's no place to recover the content to, to true it back up to its uh, policy you know, for protection scheme when this happens. So you're basically running in, in what amounts to a degraded mode. Now, as long as nothing happens to the first chassis, you're okay. The clients can come in, they can read data, and, and they could even write data potentially uh, given certain settings that are dropped in that we typically don't recommend in production. But um, you, know, you definitely can read the data, and but, but there's no word to recover it too. So you have to wait for that second chassis to be repaired or to come back online uh, before things can be treated back up in the cluster again. Yeah. Correct. And then um, I guess if it, we're, we're going to walk through the ratio coding example. I think this is probably the protection method that uh, most people don't really understand. Uh, so, it, you know, if, let's start with a, a description, definition of what erasure coding actually is. Yeah, certainly. So, so when you're using uh, protection for your, for your content with erasure coding, uh, the object storage is automatically going to, to take what you load into the system, and it's going to create and distribute segments evenly across all the nodes that reside within the storage cluster. Or, and if you have subclusters configured where you have groups of chassis that are, that are, that are handled in, in, a, in, in a given fashion, you know, let's, let's say you want to have protection per rack or you want to have you know, protection per power distribution unit or whatever, you, you would use a subcluster approach. And that's, that's what we're referencing there. But, but ultimately, it's going to take those segments and it's going to spread them across those, those divisions that have been defined for, for the cluster. And the thing to bear in mind here is that, um, and, and we'll, we'll go into more deep dive as to what KMP means, but if, if you have P parity segments, uh, if you have P or fewer segments on, on any one of, of the nodes, then the loss of that node can be tolerated. Yeah, and let's let's do a deeper dive into to K and P. Right, exactly. So so when we're talking about K and P, K of course is data, P is parity. Um, P is going to be equivalent to the number of simultaneous volume losses that you can have without data loss, and it must be greater than one. Now, if you're using subclusters, uh, you may decide that, uh, you, or in larger clusters, when you when you approach very large scale, 
you, you may decide to split things up so that's the, the number of simultaneous nodes you can tolerate to fail or or the number of simultaneous subclusters you can you know afford to have down but but ultimately that's that, that's what we're referencing here the number of items in the cluster the divisions in the cluster you can have unavailable and, and still uh, access your data what what k gives you control over is, is the is the, the space distribution and ultimately your efficiency is defined by the equation that we show you there uh, which is k plus p divided by k that is your data footprint for the erasure coding scheme that you have chosen uh, it is worth noting that larger KMP numbers are going to require more resources in the form of CPU memory and, and ultimately, like we just said, that the number of nodes that are needed to make sure that, that you can have that data available when requests come in to, to read it. And, and we have a simple table over here to the right, AJ, where we walk through the, the, the comparisons between uh, typical protection schemes that, that are encountered uh, in the field. You, you have your usual rep equals two, your rep equals three, and 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 then typically what people use for erasure coding is something along the lines of the mo the ones we see the most, AJ, are, are EC52 or or EC63, and and the comparisons there, you know, for the footprint multiplier, you know, as as we said previously, overhead for rep equals two is 100%, overhead for rep equals three is 200%, the amount of storage that's needed, the raw storage that's needed to to store a terabyte of data becomes two terabytes for reps equals two, three terabytes for reps equals t, three, et cetera. And then of course, in the last column, we have the simultaneous volume loss tolerance for, for those protection schemes. But, but as you dive down into erasure coding, uh, you see the magic start to occur. So let, let's talk about EC52 because that's a very common one. We talk about that all the time. Um, and as we go into this scenario, the um, you get, you get your 40% overhead and so on. And, and let's talk about what happens when, um, when these fail. So in our example here, we have an EC52 scenario. You have three chassis or servers. Each of them have three volumes and the accounting scheme used for, for data is 52, five data, two parity. This creates seven segments total that are evenly distributed across the cluster as best as possible. In this case, best as possible is two segments on one, two segments on the other, and three on the remainder. And then there are two parity segments. And what that means is you can tolerate the loss of two of those segments uh, in, in order to, uh, to, to still read uh, the data in the system. So in this case, you can lose any two volumes uh, or you can lose an entire chassis. You, you can, you can use, lose chassis one or two, but you can't lose chassis three because again, it has, a, has three uh, as part of the remainder for the distribution. And the other key takeaway here is that if, if one of these chassis will fail, uh, recovery will fail because there are not enough re uh, remaining resources in the cluster to reinstantiate uh, re the, the, uh, the segments that are needed to true everything up uh, for the objects that have been written in that fashion. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yep. Forgot to yeah, click that. Exactly. Yep. And, and, and the key thing here, AJ, is, of course, is you, you can still read the data. You, it, it, it's just going to be a degraded mode, right? You can't afford the loss of another chassis, and you, you certainly can't afford the loss of chassis three in this distribution. Right. And then we have the same scenario, but with three two. Yeah, now now we tune things to to accommodate the resources that we have available in the cluster and the associated failure failure modes that we may be concerned with. So in this case, we have three data, two parity. That's five segments that are evenly distributed, quote unquote, evenly as best as possible across the cluster with two on one server, two on the other, and one on the remainder. So the loss tolerance here, uh, you can still access this object if you lose any two volumes, or you can lose a chassis. And, and in, furthermore, recovery will succeed because there are enough resources remaining in the cluster to, to bring back the total of three data and two parity to have all of that recreated within the cluster while, that, while the, any one of these chassis is down. And uh, as, as far as erasure coding sizing, how, how do you work with customers to determine the right erasure coding method for them? There, there are a lot of key uh, inputs that we try to look for if we can get them, AJ, uh, when, when, when trying to uh, design the best erasure coding protection scheme or policy for their deployment. Uh, first and foremost, of course, as we mentioned earlier, we try to look a look, take a look at the, uh, 
the file size? Does it fall in that range where erasure coding makes sense for, for their use case? And if the answer, of course, to that is yes, then we, then we move on to, you know, what kind of failure modes are you willing to tolerate? What kind of availability and durability do you need to have for the data that resides in the system? And, and that's going to give us some insight uh, as to what kind of protection scheme they want to use. And, and of course, we want to know what kind of efficiency they're targeting to. And we, we have to take all those inputs and, and we, we basically have to iterate to, you know, what amounts to the most optimized approach for what they're trying to do for what they what they plan to deploy. But those are the inputs we look for typically. Yeah, and, and I mean, this does look rather complex, but this is all policy based, correct? You, you kind of pick an erasure coding scheme, replication scheme in the life of the data, and then you just set the policy and the system takes care of it. Correct. There, there right. isn't this manual, continuous manual management of protection policies. That's right. And, and, and policy isn't just locked in at the global cluster level. Uh, you, you can have uh, these policies set that in a different fashion down at the domain level, for example. Uh, and, and, you know, depending on the nature of the data and the domain or for different uh, entities or, or applications or, or even business units that may be using it, they, they may have different schemes associated with, with the data that they're putting in the system, depending on their requirements. And, and, and again, that's the flexibility that we bring to the table. And it's certainly that automated flexibility that we bring to the table to assist with scaling this solution to a very large pool of data. We do have a question, John. It says, if, if I'm using EC5.2 with seven chassis, do I still have a single point of failure? Uh, the single point of failure? No. And in fact, you should be able to recover if one chassis goes down. All right. Well, that answers that question. And so we covered how erasure coding works, how replication works. Now let's talk about uh, you know, proactive issue detection and automated recovery. So now we, we talked about how you can actually protect the data, the methods that you can choose. Now, so what, what happens? Why is object storage so good at protecting petabyte scale environments? Well, a well-designed object storage solution is, is going to have uh, what we've, we're defining here. It's going to have a, a health processing, an automated health processing component uh, built, you know, built into its DNA, basically. Because like, you know, like we say here, at petabyte scale, you are going to run into some kind of issue uh, you know, with, with the chances of something failing within the overall cluster, you know, at various hardware component uh, levels. And, and you have to be able to co be constantly checking for that, uh, to be able to react to those failures immediately and, and, and make sure that the data is protected and so on. But, but even then, in the background, you, you want to constantly be walking through the system. You're looking for things like bit rot, right, AJ? You know, items of that nature, ma making sure that your, your data has not degraded over time. And, and that's that's what this process is doing here. And you know, between between looking for bit rotten and making sure that you uh, you recover and true everything up to to being fully protected per its policy, um, that that's that's the nature of of the solution that you need to have when you scale to to this level uh, of storage. And let's cover what what happens when a when a drive fails. I think we we talked about the the data replication, but you know. Can you walk everyone through this slide? Yeah. Uh, so what happens when a drive fails? Uh, in, in Swarm, a loss of a drive, you know, where, where data may be left uh, underprotected, you know, as, as in the scenarios we described previously, that's considered what is quote unquote an emerge messaging each other. Um, so, so what you want to see happen in a best read object store, it's going to make every effort to immediately kick off what's necessary to restore that data to, to full protection, be it full replication of all the objects that are in the system, or making sure that that all the uh, the EC components, the the data and parity segments, are fully recreated within the system, so that it, it's it's it goes back to its its full protection. Uh, ultimately, in the, in Swarm's goal, it's to minimize the window of time where data is unprotected, because you know typically what we see happen in the field, uh, AJ, when it rains, it pours. You you may have a situation where uh, you, you have a certain number of, of servers or drives that were made in the same lot. So, you know, one server with one set of drives starts to encounter issues and, and starts to degrade. You may have a situation where not far after that, another system in the cluster starts suffering from that too. So you want that window to be really tiny 
so that you don't have so many simultaneous failures piling up on you at once that things become unrecoverable. Absolutely. And then um, how about the mechanics of recovery versus NAS? We talk about NAS and the overhead, but what, what, what is that? What's actually the difference when, when an issue is encountered? The, the main difference here is that in, in, the, in the case of, of object storage, especially a well-architected solution, all of the cluster, all of the nodes in the cluster are going to participate in this recovery process. Like I mentioned previously, they're going to see that notification that, you know, oh, this node has failed or, or this chassis is no longer available in the cluster. And, and they're, going, they're all going to pile in and, and do whatever it takes to, to true up everything that was associated with that hardware component in the cluster. And as a result, your recovery performance is gonna increase as cluster size increases. And we've got another slide that, that goes through scenarios like that. Whereas with RAID on NAS or SAN, um, you may have specialized components, you know, such as, such as SSDs for, for journaling, um, and or you just need to have SSD period so that uh, you know, the rebuild of the, of the array can take place as quickly as possible before yet another failure happens in that array. Uh, a lot of these solutions, uh, you may find yourself bottlenecked through a single controller, for example. Uh, you may find yourself in a situation where that single controller fails for whatever reason and takes the whole thing down. You don't, you don't have that problem in, in, a, in the object storage solution because when you scale up and scale out with servers, all of the CPU associated with all the servers, all of the memory associated with all the servers, all the network interface cards associated with the servers, all the disk controller cards associated with that, all of those are, are participating in recovery at the same time. Yeah, and that's what this, this table shows, correct? As, as, as you scale the, the, the effect of the participation. Do you wanna walk everyone through this? Sure, the example we have here is we have a thousand objects that are stored in the cluster. Uh, the protection scheme, of course, is our usual reps equals two. And, and we walk through clusters of various sizes. Uh, in the column there, we have three, 10, and 100 nodes in the cluster. Um, and we show the distribution of the objects in, uh, in, that, in that cluster based on the node count. So um, in the case of, of three nodes, your distribution is, is roughly 667, you know, 2,000 divided by three. Uh, for, for the objects in the node. And as a result, if any one of those nodes fail, uh, the each no of the remaining nodes is gonna have to recover 333 of that. And there's only one other node that can receive those recovered objects. So as you can imagine, that, that can overload things pretty quickly in a small cluster like that as, as the object count goes up. As you move, move further through to 10 and ultimately the 100 node scenario, you notice that the distribution per node goes way down. And as a result, the, the things that need to be recovered um, if that component fails within the cluster becomes much smaller. And the recovery is much faster because the, you have 98 other nodes in the cluster that can participate in that recovery process and, and can take on the data that was associated with that failed component. So I want the, the viewers to kind of take a mental snapshot here, and then if they can go back in memory, maybe I can help them out. And uh, we go back and we take a look at the erasure coding efficiency for 10.2. And you start to combine those two tables. You're seeing as a cluster grows, not only can you use erasure coding, which is a lot more efficient from an overhead perspective, but now with the number of nodes in the system, you're also getting the added value of being able to recover faster. So I think by combining those two, you see as the cluster grows, why object storage is, is such a great method for protecting petabyte scale environments. But would you add anything else to that, John? Yeah, and, and that all goes back to the, to the fact that, you know, you have the distribution playing in your favor, regardless of, of if it's replication or erasure coding. And, and certainly so with erasure coding, because there are more segments associated with an object stored in the system as a result. And uh, you want that recovery to be fast. You want everything to participate quickly to rebuild those segments. So it, it's definitely in your favor to, to take advantage of, of the distribution characteristics of a larger cluster. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we talked about, you know, cluster, but now let's talk about 
replicating data, data to the cloud, data to another site, you know, for disaster recovery, uh, for disaster recovery purposes. Uh, so yeah, how, how easy is that to do with object storage and, and why is it easy to do with object storage? It, it, it's actually fairly easy to do with, with object storage and, and it's typically done through through what we call a feed mechanism, AJ. And, and there are two types of feeds that we can deal with for, for this requirement. There, there's the replication feed that allows you to replicate data from one object storage cluster to another. Uh, we also have the, the S3 feed mechanism that allows us to, to copy or replicate that data uh, up to, you know, for example, Amazon S3, right? And, and you can have it available in the cloud as a result for, for disaster recovery purposes. And, and what we're showing here is, is just the, the UI console for, you know, what it would look like if you, if you were looking at this in, in our UI, you know, what the statistics for, for the uh, example here, uh, a feed would look like. Yeah, and here you, you can do it to a, a different swarm site, different um, you know, site, or you can also do it to S3, the, the, the service, correct? Or, or any S3 enabled device. But yes, basically any uh, S3 target. In fact, one of the ways we've tested this, AJ, is, is we, we tested this against another swarm cluster that was uh, providing an S3 endpoint. And, and we're able to use our own S3 endpoint to, to do it this way as well. So it's, uh, it's uh, kind of neat to, to watch it work. But yeah, any, any viable S3 endpoint, you'd have the capability to, to use this method as well. Yeah, and some that we see out there in the field, we, we point them out, it's not just Amazon S3 or any one of the flavors of, of Glacier, uh, the service that they have. Uh, there's also services like Wasabi or Fujifilm Object Archive, which is a tape archive. So you know, there, there's, there's a lot of different options from a, from a feed or replication perspective. But how, how complex can you get with those replication topologies, John? Here's just an, an example here. Right. Uh, the, the replication topologies we support, uh, for, for lack of a better way to describe it, is, is an M to N mapping. We, we can do it in that fashion. And, and you see examples of that here uh, in these diagrams. So, for example, on the left hand side, uh, we have uh, three clusters, A, B and C. They, they are all replicating data to, to on-prem object, you know, to, to the mothership, we like to call it, you know, or, or, or maybe the central office. But, but cluster A also has the added requirement that I want, I want to push that out to a, a cloud service provider S3 endpoint, such as Wasabi or AWS, or perhaps I want to push it out to uh, a tape endpoint that provides a, an S3 uh, interface, such as Fujifilm. You know, they, they want to protect it further uh, in that fashion. And, and you, have, you have the capability of, of setting it up in that way and having them all run simultaneously uh, once those feeds are defined. It'll, it'll, it'll replicate that data automatically to, to the targets that you designated in the feed definition. Uh, you also have the capability to, to do an initial replication, let's say, to uh, another cluster and then perhaps, uh, you know, temporarily, quote unquote, air gap or shut down access uh, to that cluster, or even just you know, uh, pause that feed in cluster C, and 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 then perhaps shut down the access in some other method. And at that point, you have a logical or or even a, perhaps even a physical air gap for the data that was replicated from cluster C to that cluster at at a given point in time. And that that comes in really handy uh, if you want to protect against things like ransomware attacks and 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 so on, where where you can make absolutely sure that. There's no way for anybody coming in and issuing deletes to objects, you know, because usually that's what happens, right? You have a, you have a, 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 a delete portion of, of, uh, of people, you know, putting your data under hostage. And uh, this prevents that from happening and allows you to be able to recover it from that, that one cluster that's been gapped away from everybody else. Yeah, and that's a, that. That's an important point. I think we're seeing a lot of you know momentum growing as far as you know the need to protect very large scale data sets from ransomware attacks and and just malicious attacks in general. And there are a number of other features that are inherent to, to object storage. Uh, some unique to Swarm. Uh, some are are available in in most object storage solutions. But you know, why don't you walk everyone through each of these and and how they can protect data at scale? Sure. So, so we'll just walk left to right. Um, from an authorization perspective, uh, we have the ability to provide full, you know, authorization, authentication, accounting, uh, and, and auditing, right? Quadruple A, typically what you see, uh, you know, is the industry standard, 
uh, in the field. So, you know, you, you can set things up in such a way that, that, that only certain users or groups are allowed to perform certain operations uh, against a given set of objects that reside in the cluster. Uh, you know, moving further through that, of course, we support the capability uh, to have uh, encryption at rest for the volumes themselves. Let, let's say you have a volume that, that goes offline, but you want to make absolutely sure that, you know, when you RMA that volume or whatever, nobody can see the data that's on it. We, we do support full volume encryption at rest for, for, uh, for the drives that, that reside within the Swarm solution if, if you choose to use that. And, um, you know, as long as they don't have access to the keys, they will not be able to read the data that, that's off those volumes. And then, of course, you know, there's, uh, there's support for things like having comes, uh, being able to send things out over uh, TLS, you know, for end to end encryption as, as well. So encryption in transit. Uh, we provide the capability, of course, for immutability or, or worm, as the case may be, uh, or, you know, perhaps even, you know, being able to uh, lock the object if necessary. Um, you know, that's, that's where immutability comes into play. So, you know, you know, that you can ensure that, you know, once you've written something, um, no, however, however many times you read it, you, you have assurances that, that, that data has not been tampered with. Uh, there, there's hashing, you know, for example, for authentication for passwords, let's say you, you need to hash a pass, a password for administrative access through the systems. We, we don't necessarily do that in clear text. You can hash those passwords as well. So they're not clear. And then finally, we have versioning. So you have the capability to uh, create multiple versions of, of objects in the cluster and as they may change over the time. You may change the uh, the metadata that's associated with them while keeping the body intact, or you may even change the, the entire object itself. You may change the body of it as well. And, and we provide the capability to have different versions of that object reside within the system that, that can be referenced with an, with an API call so that you can reference which specific version you want to work with. So, you know, this, this whole chain of features that we have here, AJ, uh, along with the ability to, to even have, you know, a temporary or permanent air gap upon replication to a given state uh, gives you a very ideal way to protect that petabyte scale, uh, your, your data, you know, petabyte scale data source from ransomware attacks or, or other bad actors. Yeah, and of course, you always have the the standard value props of object storage where you can continuously upgrade the hardware beneath the data. You can continue to to make sure you're using the most optimal and efficient, you know, hardware, hard drives, um, you know, chassis, the most power efficient. Uh, so it, we, we just focused on some of the, the resilience and recovery features. But when you pair these with the standard, you know, value proposition and the features in, in object storage, it really becomes a very powerful solution. Now let's talk about bringing it all together. So, you know, from an object storage resilience and recovery perspective, just just covering what what we what we just presented, we demonstrated how object storage uh, enables customizable copies of data across various chassis, offsite also offline or air gapped with all of the added data protection features. And we also showed how you can do that at petabyte scale and why object storage is, is one of the unique ways to do this at petabyte scale. You know, we, we showed how all of the nodes participate in recovery. And we also showed how as a cluster grows, the efficiency that you get by using erasure coding from a protection method really kicks in um, because you can protect content and, and only um, you know, really need to uh, assign you know 20 to 30 percent overhead to get you know very very good uh, resilience uh, from your object storage solution. So let, let's let's map. I mean, do you have anything to add here, John, before we map that to the the traditional three two one one backup rule? I, I would add another thing that gives you, you know, a certain measure of resilience and flexibility, you know, to touch on what you talked about with, with being to basically upgrade the hardware out from underneath the solution and, and not have, you know, clients recognize that at any one point in time. A, a well-designed object store is going to design around the concept of volume portability. And, and one of the Achilles heels of the traditional, you know, file system and RAID approach or, you know, SAN or NAS approach it's not really possible to, you know, take a drive out of one array and stick it into another array, right? Uh, you may have a situation where there's nothing wrong with your your hard drives, but a motherboard dies, right? And you need 
you need to be able to bring that up quickly. In that situation, you may, you may not even need to rebuild because all you have to do is pull, pull the volumes out of that one server, plug them into another server, bring that server back online. The cluster recognizes it joining the cluster. At that point, the data that's on those volumes is available to any client request that comes in the cluster. Yeah, that's that's a good point. We didn't even cover that, but I th thank you for bringing that up. And I think in today's world where, where you have remote hands or you have a lot, maybe maybe certain employees uh, can't get into the data center, but you still need to, um, you know, go ahead and swap out chassis, that, that you can have a lot of mistakes there. So having yeah, a durable solution where you can pull a drive and then put it back in, you know, you have an oops moment, uh, you know, a solution like Swarm handles that gracefully and just keeps on going. So just, just to repeat what John said, you can rip one drive out of one chassis and put it in another. And because of the, the global namespace of Swarm, that data will still be available. You don't need to rebalance. The system takes care of it all. So I think that's a pretty important point to, to bring up. Thanks, John. So uh, how, how does this all map to the 3211 backup rule? You know, we, we hear backup vendors you know, talk about this a lot, you know, having three copies of data on two different types of media, one off-site online copy and one offline copy. And I think we demonstrated all of these. You can do all of these with object storage. So uh, I, I guess the point to, to get across here is you know, we're, there is absolutely a place for backup applications and there is absolutely a place for RAID and for NAS. But for your tertiary, your secondary and tertiary data sets, you know, when you're talking about petabytes of data, when you're talking about billions of files, do those traditional backup methods and those those protection methods work at that scale for you and and more importantly for your budget you know if if you're struggling with that then you should really take a good hard look at object storage and uh, anything to add to this john yeah certainly uh when, when we describe when we say that you know you can cost effectively protect petabytes of data the, the key cost savings here is in that second item, AJ, from, from my personal philosophical perspective, where they call out that you need to have two different types of media. With a, with a well-designed object storage solution, you can collapse that requirement because you have geo, geographically dispersed clusters that you're replicating between. It really doesn't matter whether or not their media is different, right? You know, you're you're still providing that 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 full set of protection, and and it, it, you could even have uh, clusters replicated on site if you choose to do it in that fashion, where you have a cluster on one side of the building and a cluster on the other side of the building, and and they're doing you know cross cluster replication with each other. It really doesn't matter that they're using different media. You know, it doesn't really buy you anything to 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 do it that way. In fact, you're probably better off taking advantage of economies of scale by using the same type of media and the same server types in, in, in the two different rooms, right? You know, just as a, a simple example. So, so there, there are a lot of opportunities here to, to save you cost when, it, when attempting to protect your data in this traditional 3211 backup or rule approach uh, that I think no people realize is, is available to them when, when they're leveraging object storage uh, within their environment. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that's a great point. And this is, you know, it, it, it's, it's just a rule. And, and I think, John, you brought up a, a great point that, you know, what, what are you really trying to get at? What, what, what's your goal? What's your objective? And, you know, does the media really matter? Put it on two different hard drives. And if you're worried about, you know, drives failing from the same, um, you know, batch, go ahead and use two different vendors, you know, and or two different types of chassis. You could approach it more from a performance perspective as opposed to a protection one. You can have a primary cluster that has very fast storage. You know, let's say it has, you know, enterprise grade drives that are running at, you know, 10,000 RPM, just simple example. And, and then you could have the, the DR cluster that, that's more of a, a deep archive type of approach, right? Because it's not getting hit with client traffic and, and you could use slower, you know, drives or maybe larger drives or more dense uh, solution with your with your chassis count over there, and, and that could that could accommodate that requirement as well. But but the key here is you have the flexibility to make that you know decision, you know given the set of requirements that you have to work with for for any deployment that that you're envisioning. Absolutely, and then uh, so let's you know talk about closing and next steps. This is probably uh, the uh, the. Uh, 
the single most important uh, piece of advice that we can give. Right, John? Oh, most definitely. Yeah, don't so, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And we, and we walk through the various methods that can be used with object storage to avoid painting yourself into this corner. I mean, it, it, do you have any sort of real world uh, experiences you can share here or any, any, I always like to ask for words of wisdom. I mean, don't put all your eggs in one basket is, is de are, are definitely words of wisdom, but any other experiences or, or, or words of wisdom to share uh, before we walk to the closing slide? Well, there, there are definitely have been situations where our customers have been able to take advantage um, of the fact that they've set up clusters in such a way that they're doing cross-site replication. Uh, so that, you know, no matter which way the client traffic comes in, they, you know, especially for rights, uh, they're ensured that, that that data is replicated over from the original point where it was instantiated, uh, the, the backup of that has moved over to the other cluster. And we have a lot of customers in the field that, that use our solution in that fashion for that reason. They're, they're, not only, they're not only balancing the client traffic, they're balancing the fact to make sure that when data is written, no matter which cluster it's coming into, it's protected on the other side. Yeah, definitely. Great words of wisdom. And as far as next steps, if you go to the datacore.com up in the top level nav, you'll see a resources section. If you click on that and you click on white papers, we have a great white paper that dives into detail on what John and I just spoke about. It's called Data Protection with Swarm Object Storage. It's, uh, it was written by one of our, our lead engineers, Don Baker. It's really good. It goes over you know, the different data protection schemes that are uh, used in, in swarm object storage, including a, an overview of, of uh, elastic content protection. As always, if you have any questions, you can email them to us at info at datacore.com. If you have any specific questions for John or I, just go ahead and you know, state that in the uh, text of the email and they will get directed to us. Uh, with that, we, we'd like to open up for questions. If you have any questions, we did answer the ones that I have seen uh, throughout the uh, the presentation. We did have a request for for this actual presentation. You could reach out to your data core representative, and and uh, we'll be able to to work that out. So just reach out to your your data core rep, and uh, we will follow up with with the presentation directly to you. And again, you we we talked about um, you know words of wisdom, John. Any any closing statements? I mean, that, I, I think we're we're in this world now. It's it's just very unique where where people can't get into the data center. I mean, we're seeing these these massive malicious attacks. I mean, as 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 far as you know, what people need to think about from a recovery and a resilience perspective. I mean. Where where would you recommend they all start? I mean, this is a very very complex problem. I mean, where do you see organizations start from a, from an evaluation perspective? Like, how do you get your hands around this? Well, you know, certainly, I'm you know not 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 to get too far into the weeds, but but ultimately, this starts out as a business requirement. You know, where a risk assessment is done on the nature of the data that your your managed structure for managing that data that provides uh, the appropriate defense in depth. And, and the ability to, uh, you know, control access and to quickly recover from uh, any unwanted or, or unwarranted events, right? And and when when it comes to doing that, you know, my my takeaway, I hope that everybody has from all of this is that uh, object storage and swarm object storage in particular is an incredibly strong component in that overall approach for protecting your data. Um, it, it's built to to be very resilient in the face of failure. It's built to protect against things like bit rot over time. It has the the necessary access controls uh, in place to make sure that 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 only authorized parties are allowed to do certain operations on the data that's stored in 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 the system. You have the ability to to set up uh, replication and even even you know, replication policies, depending on the domains that you want to send, as opposed to the entire cluster, of what gets replicated to where. And, 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 and ultimately, you're presented with a, a really strong tool, you know, in your toolkit for protecting the, the organization's data uh, when, you're, when you leverage an object storage solution like ours. Well said. Well said. I don't have anything to add to that. And it looks like we don't have any additional questions. 
Uh, so I would like to thank everyone for their time. Thank you for sticking with us. I think most of the attendees uh, stayed for, for the end of the presentation. John, as always, uh, it was a great presentation. Thank you for sharing your experiences with us. Oh, wait a minute, we have one question coming in. Let me make sure that I get file protocols. Does it support? Uh, so what, what file protocols does, does this swarm support? Um, well, of course, when you're act interacting with an object store, typically you're interacting with it in, in a RESTful API fashion. So it's, you know, it's going to be HTTP 1.1. You know, if you have any kind of HTTP library, you're, you're going to make be making calls with the appropriate verbs to manipulate the data in the system. So to, to cook that down, you're either going to be working with our native protocol, which we call SCSP or Simple Content Storage Protocol. You can also use the, the S3 protocol, the Amazon S3 protocol to, to work with data within our system. Uh, and, and there are also uh, things that you can layer on, on, on top of that, uh, such as SwarmFS, for example, uh, which, which provides what amounts to an, an NFS protocol gateway for legacy uh, systems which may not have the capability for whatever reason to, to integrate with an object store directly. They, they could integrate it through, a, through an NFS uh, like interface, but those are typically the uh, the targets that are used when when putting data in the system. And, and of course, the magic to all of that, as, as AJ touched on earlier, is our ability to provide a unified namespace for all of that. So, if, let's say you have clients drop something in with our, our a native integration with SCSP, and then you want to turn right around and you want to make sure that that data uh, can be accessed. Uh, by uh, by teams that are using S3 clients, for example, you, you can be assured that when they come in and make those S3 requests, uh, that data will be there and it, it can be seen and manipulated through through S, S3 calls. And, and we, we provide that unified namespace that allows that to happen. All right, and that that actually is all the questions. I, I don't think we have any additional questions. So. All right, well, thank you again, uh, viewers out there for, for joining us uh, this morning or this afternoon or this, this evening, wherever you are in the world. And um, once again, thanks, John. Great, uh, uh, great, great information, uh, high value. And as always, if you have any questions, just email us at info at datacore.com and we will make sure it gets routed to the, uh, to the right party and get a response to you as quickly as possible. So uh, once again, thanks. Thanks, John. Oh, my pleasure. And this concludes our webinar. Thanks, everyone.